si se angustia el corazón y tu voz no alcanzo a oír, me aferraré a ti, aunque no pueda ver. Si la vida es un pesar y un tormento proseguir, seguiré confiando en ti y esperaré. Y recordaré que has hecho en la cruz Y la vida que ahora tengo en Jesús Fue tu amor que vino a mí Me salvó, me llevó a ti Tú ya soy, tú ya por siempre Como un grado de bostaza Eso lo dice el Señor Si tuvieras fe Como un grado de bostaza Eso lo dice el Señor Tú le dirías A la montaña Muévete Muévete Tú le dirías A la montaña Muévete Muévete Esa montaña se moverá esa montaña se mueve, se mueve, se mueve, esa montaña se mueve. Si tuvieras fe como un grano de mostaza. Good morning. Welcome to Vineyard Milwaukee. If you're joining us online, welcome. Uh, we're we're going to worship today. We're going to make way for the presence of the Lord in this place. Let's 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 in, let's stand in this place and invite the Holy Spirit to come. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place in our hearts. Come have your way. Have your way. Right. Make way for 
you 
rocks you in I'm laying down I want to know you Lord I used to think I could box you
the simple gospel. rejoice in your presence. We rejoice in your love. You reach out to us. And we receive your embrace. And we receive your love this morning. Amen. And you can be seen in Good morning. Good morning. Um, I, it was noted this morning that I looked nice and springy this morning, but not, I, I didn't dress for the weather. I did not anticipate the rain. I never do. I am one of those people that just leaves the house and gets caught in the storm. So I was up early this morning and out and about and already, uh, already got wet, but I'm glad to be here. Thanks for braving the rain and coming out. It's good to see you. Good to be with you. Um, so just a few quick announcements, no major announcements this morning. Just our regular, if you need to reach out to us for any reason for prayer, to connect, um, to be added to our newsletter. We do have a, uh, several items coming out in the next few weeks. So if you're, for some reason, not on our, our email list, please scan that QR code on, on your table and... Um, let us know what your email address is and um, anything going on in your life if you'd like prayer for. If you don't have a, a smartphone, don't know how to scan the QR code, there's a black box in the back. You can just fill it out by hand. There's some papers underneath. Let us know and slip it in the black box, and we'll be sure to add you to our email letter. Okay, Samuel, so do that today before you go. That way you'll know what's going on. All right, we need your email. All right, so I'm going to, I was going to do a little quick recap this morning of kind of what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, but I just thought I'd show you a video instead, save my breath a little bit. So we're going to start with a short video. If you've ever heard of Jesus of Nazareth, you probably know he was a famous teacher and his most well-known words have shaped the lives of billions of people throughout history. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do to others what you would have them do to you. Now, those sayings come from a collection of Jesus' teaching that's sometimes called the Sermon on the Mount. It's only three chapters long, but its ideas and images have endured throughout time. You are the salt of the earth. You can't serve both God and money. Take the plank out of your eye before you take the speck out of another's. In the sermon are some really challenging teachings. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, turn and offer him the other cheek. Love your enemy and bless those who persecute you. And there are also some really puzzling teachings. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. But the Sermon on the Mount is not a random collection of Jesus' teachings. They've been organized in a beautiful way so that it's easier to remember and meditate on. There are three main parts of the sermon, the middle of which has three parts, and then each of those middle parts themselves have three parts. Wow, the sermon has been carefully designed. Yes, and right at the center of the center is the famous prayer that Jesus taught his followers. Our Father in heaven, may your name be treated as holy. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what does that mean for God's kingdom to come on earth? Well, we have to remember that Jesus was Jewish and he grew up meditating on the Hebrew Bible, the sacred scriptures of Israel. And they told the story of God and all humanity. How God created a well-ordered world and appointed humans to rule it on his behalf. And when humans rule with God's wisdom and love, and when justice and peace prevail and there's enough for everyone, that is God's kingdom and God's will being done here on earth as it is in heaven. And that's no easy task. Humans foolishly rebel and start building their own kingdoms by their own wisdom. And so God chose one family, the Israelites, and he offered them his wisdom. It was called the Torah, which in Hebrew means the teaching. 
and beginning with Moses on Mount Sinai, God entered into a sacred covenant with them. Why only select one family? Well, the goal was for the Israelites to be transformed by God's wisdom so that they could represent God's kingdom before all the nations. But in Jesus' day, God's kingdom was nowhere to be seen. In fact, Israel was under the thumb of Roman oppressors. So what happened? Why isn't God's kingdom coming? Well, many religious leaders, like the scribes and the Pharisees, they thought it wasn't coming because Israel wasn't being faithful enough to the Torah. Other leaders, called the Sadducees, thought it would be best if Israel found a way to cooperate with Rome, and so they became the power brokers of Jesus' day. Some ran for the hills to become freedom fighters against Rome. They're known as the Zealots. And still others withdrew to the desert, waiting for God to use them to start a new Israel. But walk around the hill country of Israel, like Jesus did, and you'll mostly find normal people figuring out their lives as best they can. Most were barely hanging on, lots of poor and sick people. Many had lost their land to the Roman occupiers and were struggling to pay the heavy taxes. They were powerless and hopeless. And so Jesus went to these people, healing the sick and announcing that God's kingdom was arriving. People gathered from all over to hear his teachings. And one day, Jesus went up to a tall hill and said the arrival of God's kingdom was starting here and now with them. You mean with the powerless, the weak, the nobodies, God's kingdom begins here? Yes. This is why the very first line of the Sermon on the Mount is, blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, where can you go and see God's presence and blessing springing to life? Among the rich? Among the powerful? No, Jesus says. Look where people are poor, where they feel crushed and defeated. God's kingdom is beginning with the people standing right here. So if you missed church last week, that's pretty much what I said. So (laughs) there's your recap. You got it. Yep. And so I I was speaking on if you've been with us and we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount, It's good. I like the background. It keeps us all engaged. We're very, we like lots of like screen time, right? It helps keep us focused. Yeah. Got to be a little animated here. Um, I was reading from the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God or the kingdom of the skies, depending on your translation. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, which I talked about means the vulnerable, uh, for they will inherit the earth. And so this is actually um, the title for the sermon I was going to preach, which is on the next beatitude, which is um, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. But that's coming next week because the Lord was speaking to me about some new things this weekend. So I, poor Greg, like last minute, I'm like, I'm changing it all up and I need you to do these slides instead. So what was really coming to to me this weekend and I alluded to last weekend was, was talking about how this applies to us. And whereas uh, Jesus was definitely speaking about groups of people that are oppressed and marginalized, often to do with political issues, racial issues, socioeconomic issues, talking about um, systems, class systems, all of that, most of Jesus' teachings always had really big things he's saying about the way of the world, and then he has really personal things to say about your life. And so I was talking about how does this fit into our lives? Do we ever find ourselves poor in spirit? Do we ever find ourselves mourning or grieving? Do we find ourselves vulnerable, like in the meek? Whether it has to do with our socioeconomic circumstances or just life circumstances, because as human beings, all of us are going to hit a place where we're at the end of ourselves, right? Like in our limitations, we're going to have something come up against us that we're powerless over. And so what does it mean for us when we're poor in spirit? And then what does it mean for all of us as we gather around people who are poor in spirit, who are grieving, who are vulnerable? And so that's what I want to talk about today. And the main point that I felt like God was showing me this weekend, which is something that I've, I've seen and understood, and, but I've not, I felt like I, 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 God revealed it to me in a new way, was the way that, that the helpless and the vulnerable among us, for all the circumstances and reasons that people end up helpless and vulnerable, are vehicles to God's glory. 
These are actually the folks that lead us to the good life that we've been talking about. And so sometimes you are that vehicle. Sometimes you, like I said, are the poor in spirit or the grieving or the meek. And when you are, you, you often don't feel like you're being, you're a vehicle leading people to the good life. But you are. Uh, like I said, whether that's because of your position, your socioeconomic status, or because of a particular circumstance in your life. So how does this work? How are you a vehicle to the glory of God? How are you leading us to the kingdom? Well, I'll, to answer that question, I want to share with you an experience I had uh, when I was doing something called, I actually was away at a retreat at a Jesuit retreat center, and we did something called Visio Divina, which is similar to Alexio Divino, but rather than letting scripture speak to you, you're kind of letting a, a piece of artwork speak to you and kind of letting the Holy Spirit reveal something to you through some artwork. Yes. And so I wanted to show you, is you're not going to be able to see it very well at all. It's actually obviously much more detailed and beautiful in person, and I think I have a slide for it just to give you a general idea. But this comes from the St. John's Bible. It's this really unique Bible where these artists made these just beautiful paintings, uh, revealing different, high, highlighting different parts of the gospel. And so I was looking at this, and we were being led to, like, what, what is your eye drawn to? Kind of like, what's speaking to you? And then asking the Holy Spirit to illuminate, like, why? Why is this speaking to you? So I don't know if you can tell, but Jesus is actually on the cross in this picture. And the cross is all lit up in gold, which represents God's glory, um, which represents the kingdom, which represents power. And yet, Jesus, as you know, is at this moment, and as I said before, Jesus was a Jewish person, so he was among the oppressed. That's right. He was among us. And, but in this time, during his crucifixion, was his weakest, his most vulnerable, his most powerless place he'd ever been in his human experience. I mean, he was literally stripped of all power. I mean, literally, his physical body was nailed to a tree. So he's, he's vulnerable, he's without power, um, he's weak, and he's suffering. And so as I was explaining, kind of looking this over, what my eye kept being drawn to were like his arms, like the bones in his arms. Because if you look at it carefully, you can actually see like his actual like bone structures like inside like the gold part. And that's just what I kept being drawn to. And I was asking the Lord, like, what are you, what are you trying to show me here? And so what I was, I was so drawn to his humanity, his suffering, his powerlessness, and yet, it was in this moment that God's glory was revealed, that God's power was being expressed, that heaven and earth were forever coming together, that, that this was breaking all the power of all the enemies that were against humanity. And I saw that he was in that moment being the vehicle in his most powerless state for the glory of God. He was the vehicle for the power of God being revealed. And God started showing me that when people are there at their most helpless and powerless, and we get close to that, they are leading us to the good life. They are leading us to Jesus. And if you, if you looked closer at the picture, there's like people around, you can't really see from here, but they're like, they're getting a little bit of gold too, because what's happening is they're near to his suffering. They're entering into a suffering with him. And when we do that, when we enter into and share Christ's sufferings, that's what starts to do the new creation in us. So Jesus is beginning new creation here on the cross, and as we're getting close to him in his most powerless state, new creation is being birthed within us. And this is how it works among us. This is why people, when they're in their most vulnerable, when they're poor in spirit, they're grieving, um, they're suffering, and we come near it, what happens is we become more human. What happens is new creation is happening in our hearts. We begin to be transformed. That's how we're being led to the good life. That's how we're being led to the kingdom. That's how we're changing. So when I think about this in my own life, you know, when we think about new creation, how it was revealed through Jesus, uh, and how it can be revealed in our life, it is revealed through the, the, that person's divine healing that we're caring for, and we start to see the healing now, 
We don't know how much we see now. We'll see it all the way into eternity. And that new creation is, is being revealed in us as we are being changed, as we're ministering to that person. We are becoming new creation in part now and fully all throughout eternity. So when I think about... I've always had trouble putting it to words, but I've always known my daughter, who is nonverbal and without power and vulnerable, has been the vehicle that has led me to the good life. And I haven't really understood it. I just knew it's true. I knew that God's glory and power was coming through her, but it's because of as I get near her, as I take care of her, as I extend myself toward her, as I grieve with her, if I am in that place of suffering, I am being transformed. So I am, my new creation is happening in my heart, in my being. So she's being cared for, but I am being changed as well. At my prayers, our prayers are healing her, but they're healing me. Yes. You, you following me here? Yes. And this is, this is what happens as we get near the suffering of Jesus. Yes. As we see him yes. in his most powerless, vulnerable yes. place. He is right now in this picture, poor in spirit, he is grieving, and he is meek. He is vulnerable. I mentioned before that mat metaphor um, that the chosen used when Jesus said, when he's talking about the Sermon on the Mount, he said, this is like a map. When people need to find me, these are the groups they need to go to. Yes. And so we don't have to look far to see grieving, poor in spirit, vulnerable people. And so they're all around us in the world, and we talked last week about like whole people groups, but to bring it really close to home and really personal, like just look around the room, just look in your own faith community, and you see people who are grieving, and you see people that are at the end of their rope, and you see people that are vulnerable, in a vulnerable state. Some of you might be those people. You might be a person who's suffering. Yes. You might be a person who's feeling at the end of your rope and feeling without power. Suffering in Jesus will always lead us to new creation, whether we're the ones that are poor in spirit or we are coming close to someone poor in spirit. It leads us to new creation. We don't always understand it. I wondered as I was contemplating on this, like how much Jesus in his humanity how much, it, was there a point where he said, is this, is this have any meaning? Am I being totally abandoned? Was I wrong? <laughs> like, like, did he fully understand all that was happening when he was in the height of his suffering and humiliation? Like, when we are in the height of our suffering and grieving, do we fully understand what God is doing, how his purpose is, how new creation is coming out of it? But when you are in your most powerless state, as Jesus was here, you are a vehicle for the glory of God. Glory be to God. You are a vehicle for God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. And so one of the ways that suffering changes us, um, I want to talk for a minute just in a really practical way. When we think about how we are sometimes in that state of powerlessness and how sometimes we're coming along side and we're, we're entering into the suffering of another person, how we can work this out in practical ways, just even in our faith community. So one of, one of the ways uh, that, one of the things Jesus did is he asked for what he needed in, in his time of suffering. He did actually vocalize, like, can you stay awake with me? Can you be with me? Like when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Oh, wow. Did all his friends come through? Unfortunately, no. Like someone fell asleep. Some of them, when he went to the cross, abandoned him, but some of them stayed close by him. Your friends are not always going to love you and care for you just the way you need them. They're, they're not always going to be able to fully show up for you. But Jesus still asked for what he needed, knowing that sometimes our friends will let us down and sometimes they'll come through. And he received whatever he got, but he did ask for it. He even asked for a drink when he was on the cross. He was human. Yes. And so when we're in a place of need, it is important that we can name our needs yes. and reach out. People aren't always aware that you're suffering. suffering. Sometimes we tend to isolate, isolate 
and we hope that people are, list, are you know, aware of what's going on in our life, but they're not always aware. And so one of the ways that we can, when we're in the place of suffering, is to ask for, to think about what is it that I need and then ask for it. But we also need to have grace for people disappointing us in their limitations and their humanity. You also need to learn to receive the love that is coming towards you. Also, if you're in that position of powerless and suffering, just remember that Christ is very near to you. He's always very near to the suffering. Yes. Psalm 34, 18 says, Remember that God is, or the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Yes. So how are we called? In the same way that we're changed, we look at Jesus in his place of powerlessness, and we are being transformed. We are being formed in that. How will we be changed as we step into each other's suffering? We're also willing to look at someone else's state of powerlessness, their state of grieving, in their vulnerable state. Um, how are we meant to, to step into that? Well, one of the things that came to me, too, as I was reflecting on this, I was imagining myself as Jesus' mother. Now, those of you who, who our parents know, if you were watching your child being violently abused in this way, and in that kind of pain, you would come undone. Like, all you would want to do is rescue them. And yet, God didn't rescue Jesus in that moment. He wasn't meant to be rescued. But what, what his mom did was stay close to him. She was with him in it. And we are actually not called to rescue each other. And th this is a huge lesson that I'm, I'm learning. I'm not even called to rescue my own kids. Now, there's some practical ways that we can rescue each other, but you know what I'm saying here. There was actually a story that really spoke to me that the sister at the retreat center shared when I was there. And she was checking out at a um, uh, checkout station, like Kroger or whatever, pick and save, and like a self-check. And the thing wasn't working. She only had two items. She was getting super frustrated. And like the thing kept dinging, and then the bell went off. And uh, a Down syndrome young man who worked there came up to her and he just said, um, I can't help you, but I know somebody who can. And she actually wasn't making this point, but when I heard it, I just, man, it penetrated my heart. Like, that's what we're called to do. Be like, I actually can't rescue you, but I know someone who can. Like, we know someone who can. We know who the rescuer is. And so... We can't actually, like, save a person. Do you know what I'm saying? But we can be a connector, a bridge to the person who can rescue them. And so how do we do that? We do it in a number of ways. Primary way that we do this for each other is through prayer. And we do it by actually, like, laying on hands and praying for the rescuer to come right now. And we pray at home. We intercede for people. I know... Oftentimes, people will ask for prayer. The reality is, like, how much time do you really spend interceding for other people in their suffering? It's a lot of work, if I'm honest. It's a lot of work. And to me, it is one of the greatest gifts, uh, uh, greatest acts of love you can give to, to a friend or a family member or brother and sister in faith is to actually, like, pray for them. Like, actually do it. No one's going to know you did it. You're not going to get any acclimates for doing it. You're... Your reward is in heaven. But there's power behind that. There's power behind that. And people that don't have life with God may be serving and caring for that person too, but you may be the only one that actually is able to say to them, I know someone that can meet you in a way that none of us can meet you. And so I'm going to ask that person to take care of you in a way that only God can. But there are ways that we, beyond that, that we can step in. One of the ways that God's glory is revealed in suffering is the ways that we care for each other and care for people in times of suffering and powerlessness. That is often a ways that God ministers very practically to other people and demonstrates his love for that person. But we can't rescue them, but we can respond. And we can show up as Mary and John did when they stayed in hovered with Jesus and stayed with him all the way until his death. 
And many of the women that had been with Jesus are the ones that like, were able to look at the pain he was enduring and stay with him until his death. And so when I think about Jesus, when I, I did this like um, uh, Stations of the Cross, and I was thinking in the scene, those of you are familiar with the Gospels, where at one point Jesus couldn't carry his own cross. And this guy Simon came and helped him carry it. And that really is the picture of, of the life with our brothers and sisters. Sometimes you're carrying a cross, and it's too heavy for you to bear alone. And, and that's where we can come and just say, I'm just going to bear this with you. And then sometimes you're, you're kind of doing both, right? Like a lot of us, while we're bearing someone's cross, we may be bearing our own cross too. And God will give us capacity to do both in different seasons. But that's a lot of what we're doing. So how do we very practically bear people's crosses with them? Uh, it depends on what they need, right? Like do they need help with their kids? Do they need a good meal? Do they just need some friendship? Could you just invite them over to your house for dinner? Um, they just need a phone call. Uh, they just need, you know, it just depends. On, they need money. Uh, do they need some assistance that you have to offer because of certain, like, networking capabilities you have? I mean, there's just all sorts of practical things. You don't, you, it just depends on who you are and the ways that you show up and bless the world. So if you're really comfortable just sitting with people when they're in a really painful time, then just do that. Because not a lot of people are. Just be with someone. If, you're, if you like really have faith for prayer, like pray for that person. If you're a good cook, cook yes. for that person. If you like to clean, there's only a few of us out there. Yes. Even if you don't. All right? Let me just say that. Even if you don't, you can still clean. Right? What do people need? You find out what they need. Sometimes we avoid people's suffering because we either... Um, are anxious by it, and so we just don't know what to do, so we kind of look away. Um, or if you're like me, you think you're responsible to rescue them, and then you try to do too much, and you burn out, because you're like operating out of something that you were never supposed to operate with. We are, we are conduits of the love of God. We are bridges to the love of God. We do this collectively. You don't have to be a professional Christian. We take care of each other in simple ways. We are not afraid to bear our cross or someone else's because both are leading us to life. This is like the ironic upside down kingdom that both experiences are leading us to new creation. And so we can fully face a painful reality and grieve while fully facing the reality of new creation and celebrate what has come and is coming. And this is the last point I want to make. We don't just carry in our beings the ability to hover and look at someone when they're powerless and be close to them. We also bear in our beings new creation. We have to carry the resurrection story in our body too. We know Jesus was ushering new creation and it was completed in his resurrection and that's the hope we're also bringing too. And so we're celebrating new creation while we're grieving. Followers of Jesus should be the people that can equally bear grief and joy at the same time. Simultaneously hold those two realities in our hands. And that's what we're bringing. That's actually the kingdom come. Yes, we're suffering. Yes, there's tons of suffering in this world. There's things that are broken and we're grieving. And new creation has come and is coming. Both those things are true. That's the tension we live in. So what, is, what does this look like? I shared some ways it looks like among us. What, are, what does it look like when you think about those two things coming together? It looks like the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Uh, if you're familiar with T Tim, uh, what's his name? Tim Tebow's prom, the prom for special needs kids. If you've ever seen that, videos from that before, the Special Olympics. Has anyone seen the... Documenting on daughters on Netflix, where there's a daughter da daddy dance with men who are incarcerated. It was this very cool documentary I recommend. The art studio we used to do at the church, where unhoused people who had artistic talent, and some of them were incredibly talented or wanted to be creative, could come in and we could all be together and create together. Um, we've taken groups of kids from this neighborhood and from around the city to camp who've never swum in a lake before or ridden a horse. Um, 
We had a family that took my family on vacation when I was growing up when my dad was out of work. Okay, being out of work sucks. Going on vacation with a family was awesome. Both things were true at the same time. Are you following me, what I'm saying here? Um, we had a backyard barbecue with a bunch of our, our families that all had like kids on the spectrum and special needs families. And it was very chaotic and a lot of families were in pain and it was awesome. Because the kids like sprayed us all with a hose and nobody cared and we were like, these are our people. And so it was like a bit of heaven in the middle of hardships. Having a great meal with someone who's struggling with a chronic health problem. Just, we're having a moment together. We're together right now enjoying a meal and being together. Even though this reality is also true. Both these things are true at the same time. Setting up a game night or a craft night for someone who might go and be isolated or suffering a painful transition. These are things I know that have already happened in our community. The good life, the blessed life, the narrow road that leads to life, to God's abundant kingdom. If we want to participate in this new creation, we can only do this by getting close to Jesus when he was at his most helpless, most vulnerable, and most powerless, and then when he was suffering. We do this by getting close to each other when we are our most helpless and our most vulnerable and when we're suffering. Let's take communion together. Why don't you stand? I will. Listen, listen, listen. Right after I'm done, I'm going to come pray for you, okay? Yep, just wait there for me. Right now, as we take communion together, we are both demonstrating our gratitude and remembering the sacrifice of Jesus, his willingness. This is the God we serve, just so you know, like willing to not only become one of us, to give up all his power and become human, but he entered a people group that was oppressed and marginalized, and then he subjected himself to the most powerless, vulnerable state a human can be in. So when you think about people that have experienced sexual abuse or, or kids who have been abandoned. You think about like the, the most extreme kinds of sufferings. He carried all of that in his being. He was stripped naked and publicly humiliated and suffered. And we are, we are coming with gratitude because that's who God is. That's the way he decided to rescue us by entering into our suffering. But we also proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Because we know new creation has started in his resurrection. We carry new creation in our beings. We are being transformed now, and the world will be fully transformed upon his return. So his kingdom is coming, and we, his kingdom is here, and it's coming. And so that's how the, his glory is revealed in our suffering. And those of you that are, that are the, feeling the most powerless you've ever felt, it, you don't feel like it, but you are the vehicle to God's glory. My daughter is the vehicle to God's glory. This is how God works. This is when he was the vehicle to God's glory. So think about if you're in that place of pain, asking for what you need, that God is close to you in your suffering, and think about how you can carry the cross that someone's bearing. Sometimes you're carrying it. Sometimes you're supporting someone. Sometimes you're back and forth. But new creation is being revealed in both those circumstances. So we need to get near to each other, suffering with joy. And we need to carry both in our, in our bodies and in the ways we show up for each other. And so the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given to you. Every time you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, and as he poured out the wine, he said, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Let's take the cup together. So, Lord, right now, we just take into our beings your spirit, who is the only rescuer, the only one who can truly meet us in the depths of our being. 
in the places that we don't even have words for, the places where we don't even know what to ask for. Lord, we know you're interceding for us with, with groans that come up from deep within us that we don't even have, we can't even articulate. And so I pray right now you'd meet us in those places. That you'd fill us deep. All the places we're dry, all the places we're sick, all the places, Lord, that need your love, that need your power, that need your light, all the places we're feeling oppressed, or tormented, God, come in your love and your mercy. Come with new creation, Lord. Fill us with new creation. We ask for your kingdom, your kingdom of abundance, your kingdom of wholeness to come now. And so, Lord, we just offer the rest of this time and space to you and ask you to have your way with us, Lord, to minister to every part of our being. And just, God, God, I pray you grow our capacity to carry the grief of those around us who are suffering and the joy of new creation and, and just to live in that place and enter into people's suffering, God. Give us capacity to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, for ministry time, you can come back for any reason at all, obviously. Um, but I did think if you particularly feel like you're in that place of, of bearing a cross right now, um, it's just you're in a season of suffering, uh, of grieving. Uh, you feel particularly vulnerable to, to attack from the enemy or just in life. You're struggling with an addiction. There's just something coming against you. What we can do is we can't rescue, but we know the person who can. And so we just want to come alongside you and ask for God's intervention. Ask for him to meet you in that place and to minister to you. So come back and get prayer. If there's anything else going on, we'd love to pray for you. Father. 
Tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. In your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit. Oh, 
officially close our time together, but please keep receiving prayer if you are or if you still want prayer. I also just want to pray over our tithes and offerings this morning um, because I forgot to do that during announcements, so I'll do that too, and then I'll just officially dismiss us. But take time to talk with each other, pray for each other, whatever you need before you go. Uh, Lord, uh, first I just want to thank you for your generosity and your provision. And, um, and so, Lord, we just ask that you would use our offerings, our financial offerings, in ways that honor you and usher in your kingdom and are um, aligned with your heart and agenda um, for this community, for our city, and for the world, Lord. And so just align our hearts with yours, and I pray you just sow in us the generosity and the freedom you have uh, with the abundance that you provided. And God, I pray blessing and favor over everyone in this room. I pray your spirit would rest on them. I pray the joy of new creation. Uh, God, I pray that we would even um, trust you enough to walk the road of, of suffering toward the good life and, and carry the joy of new creation into people's suffering. I just pray your blessing and your favor and your peace and joy would rest on us. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you. Have a great week.